Good afternoon, everyone. Now, you can say hello back to us. It's, you know, that's a good way to start interactivity, you know. We, we appreciate that. Um, welcome to the session, Head to Head, Should We Change the Way We Compare New Drugs and Therapies to Existing Treatment? I am not Ron Winslow. Um, you probably read the, the errata sheet or whatever they call those things when they substitute one for another. So my name is Bob Blancato, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here uh, in his place. Um, turn your cell phones off. I was told to do that. I read all my moderator instructions very carefully. We had a pre-call of all our panelists, and I kept wa walking through the moderator uh, uh, instruction sheet, and everybody seemed to be comfortable with including myself. Uh, we're going to be working off the uh, program description, asking each panelist for their, a particular perspective on our topic uh, for no more than five minutes each at the beginning. At the end of the time, we'll be moving to you for questions and comments, and we hope that, you know, if it's something that Mary says uh, in the order we go in, jot them down so you have them ready when we reach the end of each of their presentations. And if there's time at the end, we may have an opportunity for intra-panel questions um, and or closing comments. First, let me introduce the panel in the order in which you will hear them. Uh, first is Mary Woolley, the president of Research America, the nation's largest nonprofit alliance working to make research to improve health a higher national priority. Mary is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And she serves on a number of boards, including the Governing Council of the Institute on Medicine and the National Council for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Alex Azar is Vice President of Business to Business and Puerto Rico for Eli Lilly USA. He joined them as uh, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Communication in 2007. He was Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, overseeing all HH pro HHS programs and operations. And he reminded me that how many years ago? Six years of East War into a job at HHS. So it's a small world that you. Um, next is Bob Honenberg. A healthcare executive with broad experience in the fields of medical devices, diagnostics, and pharmaceuticals. His areas of expertise focus on technology, innovation, clinical and economic trials, and health policy. He is currently a member of the steering committee for the Aspen Health Stewardship Project and was recently named the chief medical officer for GE Healthcare, a $17 billion unit of the General Electric Company. And last but certainly not least, Daryl Kirch, president and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, which represents the nation's medical schools, teaching hospitals, and academic societies. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine and, the National, and of the National Academies and is a distinguished physician, educator, and medical researcher. So you have a good panel here, and uh, I'm honored to be in the same table with them, I would say. The ability to compare treatments and ascertain which among them is the most clinically effective is a needed element of health care reform. Adding cost to the equation holds the promise of saving money on drugs, devices, and surgical approaches that are costly and relatively ineffective. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act included uh, $1.1 billion in new funding for comparative effectiveness research. Controversies remain. How do we structure such research to ensure the maximum benefit without discouraging proven useful treatments? So the first phase we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists a question around this, and they'll have five, up to five minutes to respond, and then we'll go on to your views. So Mary, you're first. What are the public views and expectations around comparative effectiveness research? Thanks, Bob. Um, well, the first thing to say uh, as a way of framing this conversation is that um, public opinion is important and it matters. Um, it's what ultimately will drive uh, decisions around health care reform as members of Congress and the administration listen to their constituents, to the American public. So as one of the things that Research America does in order to achieve our mission of working ourselves and helping our members of our alliance uh, be effective advocates for research for health. One of the things we do is commission public opinion polls, and we track those that others um, commission as well. So from those polls, uh, there's a few things that are of particular interest right now in this time of health care reform. Speak up just a little bit. Sorry. Louder. Yes, let's talk louder. Um, there are things of particular interest, and I'm not going to go through all of our new data, but it's very new data uh, from a poll just in the field last month in June. 
It's available online at a site called yourcongressyourhealth.org. I've got cards with that on it right here if you want them afterwards. So starting at the top line, first of all, Americans know very little about all kinds of research for health, including they don't know who conducts it. They don't know what the National Institutes of Health is. I will also put this in context. They don't know um, at very large percentages. They don't know who their own member of Congress is. So we shouldn't be horrified that there are many things that people don't know. But that said, people do have opinions. They have attitudes. They have questions and concerns. And it is very important to pay attention to that. So, for example, um, although it's, well, it's been well established by many polls that Americans are dissatisfied at very high levels, 70, 80, 90 percent levels, with health care and the cost of health care in this country, they nonetheless believe that we can both lower costs and improve the quality of care. 76% say, yes, we can do both. Um, that's partly a, a statement, I think, of the triumph of hope over experience. But it's also a charge to the people at the controls to make that happen. Um, people say uh, in very high percentages that it's, in, it's critically important to include strategies to prevent disease and promote wellness in health reform. Um, they want research accelerated in health reform at very high levels, saying it's a top priority. It is of interest, and it's always of interest to compare public attitudes to what decision makers themselves have to say and those who influence them directly in Washington. So if you, you compare the percentage of Americans who say, let's do more research, including we would say comparative effectiveness research um, as part of health care reform, 28 percent of Americans say it's a top priority and 45 percent say it's a high priority. These are big percentages. In comparison, however, um, Washington-based decision makers themselves and those in positions of great influence for those do not rank those quite as highly. They would say 20 percent as a top priority instead of 28 percent and 38 percent instead of 45 percent as a high priority. So that's an opportunity to push public um, opinion, public attitude of support um, strongly so that decision makers will rise to that level of support. Specifically about comparative effectiveness research, which we have to define in a question in order for people to have any grip at all about what this is about beyond the words, which the, the basic words do make sense to people. You're comparing two different things to see what's most effective. That's, that's not um, totally off base, although there's lots of different kinds of comparative effectiveness research. So 54 percent of the public say that they believe that this kind of research will improve health care. 16 percent say it'll have no effect, and 30 percent say, and this is worth paying attention to, that it will limit the options out there in the um, health community. So I will, I have one minute, I will give you two other pieces of information, and that is that a very robust uh, percentage, 71 percent just this last June, and equally high over the last several years of the American public say that research, when it comes to rising health care costs, research is a part of the solution, not part of the problem. So there's very high hope and expectations that research is going to guide us to what is more effective, meaning better quality, and that in the process this will lower costs. All good news, um, although not everything out there in, in public support is good news, and we see it because public opinion is malleable and very much subject to uh, what the media and others are talking about. I can get into some of those other things later. Thank, thank you, Mary. Alex, haven't drug companies been doing CER for years, and so what's new as well as what would you change uh, in the going forward? Um, the, the answer is yes, we have been doing comparative effectiveness research uh, for years in more, I'd say, in the last decade mostly. 
Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is mention some of the research that we've been doing and then talk about what the role of government can and should be with regard to comparative effectiveness research and, if time permits, talk about some of the guardrails that I think we need to put on government involvement in this process. Um, so we've been doing it in the pharmaceutical industry largely because our payers, who are one of our critical customers, are demanding it. Uh, so whether it's NICE or ICWIC or other European, Japanese uh, health technology assessment bodies, we don't get to get on the market in these countries and get reimbursed until we demonstrate to them the value of our product so that we can get, get to an agreement about what the price is of reimbursement. Here in the United States, we increasingly have similar processes, particularly with the large, the large payers, where we have to go through the same kind of a process. And what, what the payers tell us is, Comparing your drug to a placebo is not realistic in terms of what we have to do in the practice of medicine because we don't have the alternative of comparing your drug to a placebo. It's using your drug against some other drug. And so we increasingly are building into our clinical trial designs for our registration studies head-to-head -head comparator studies. Uh, we also, because of the payer requirements, are doing the other types of, of comparative effectiveness research like um, epidemiological analysis, claims-based analysis, meta-analysis of data that's out there. So, so this is already happening. Uh, the insurance companies and the payers in the U.S. and around the world themselves are doing some of this, uh, some of this comparative effectiveness research. And, of course, academics and NIH and other government organizations are doing some of it. So it's not a revolutionary concept that's just coming out of the blue here. So then we have to ask ourselves, since this is happening already, why the government? What why should the government get involved? Why should we spend a billion, $1.1 billion and then request for even more in this field? Um, I, perhaps you can, you can articulate a, a, a kind of tragedy of the commons argument in the same way that we justify why NIH has such a significant role with basic primary research, that we're generating information. Information is a common good, and so you can't contain it. And so uh, individual organizations may not have the same incentive to generate it that you might hope. Now, of course, we as innovators have a lot of incentive to generate it when our major, one of our major customers tells us we're not going to pay for your drug unless you do it. But when you think about a lot of the other critical areas that we need to do comparative effectiveness research, we're only 10 percent of the healthcare economy in the United States. The other areas like hospital procedures, surgeries, diagnostic procedures, benefit design, all of the critical questions that, that, that our health system really has failed to answer and drive towards efficiency on, the organizations that might have, that, 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 that would benefit from that kind of research don't necessarily have the incentive to devote the money uh, and effort to doing that research because they'd be creating a public good and it would get out there for everybody's benefit. So you can articulate an argument why, why you would want to have the government involved, um, in, involved in this, but it's important then to folks, that was a funding issue. That was about the government funding something that may not happen sufficiently in the competitive marketplace because of the nature of, of information, the excludability of the property rights in that information. It doesn't tell you any, it doesn't tell you the government should necessarily be doing the research. Um, and so what we need to then focus on is how do we execute this model? And I think the NIH's extramural research model is, is the way we ought to go on this. For folks who aren't steeped, like Mary and NIH, um, we put out, uh, what are we up to, about $30 billion now? $30 billion. $30 billion a year in research out of NIH. 90% of that money is just given out in grants to Harvard, to Stanford, to Johns Hopkins, to uh, all kinds of institutions. You submit a grant application, we give you a grant, and then you go do your research, and you get it published in the New England Journal or Lancet or wherever and it's not published under the U.S. government's name or anything. Only 10 percent of the research is what we call intramural, which is where the government's generating the research itself with those scientists in the nice fancy buildings that we have on the NIH campus. I think that for what we want to do in comparative effectiveness, we really ought to adopt that extramural research model of getting the money out there, because that is the issue. We're, it's getting money out there, getting research done. And that gets to how we should structure it. Um, it preserves what's very important about scientific development, which is that if the government speaks in the name of the government on these issues, you really are setting a one-time only answer to a critical question that does not respect. So the government says, this surgical procedure is better than this surgical procedure. Well, that's one study, and that's one snapshot in time. That doesn't respect the dynamic and competitive nature of the scientific inquiry and scientific information. You watch the Today Show on Monday, and you'll hear, you'll hear a story about a New England Journal article that says drinking coffee 
is good for your heart. On Friday, there'll be a study in the New England Journal, equally peer-reviewed, that says drinking coffee is bad for your heart. Okay, science is dynamic. It's not conclusive in that way. What we need to do is use this money to enhance the flow of information out there, but to allow it to be competitive and dynamic instead of the government just fixing it for one place at one point in time, which we've seen how well we do that over the course of Medicare's fee-for-service history in terms of locking things in place that then we have to go through health reform to try to bust up and, and open up for further reform. So I'm going to stop there, but there are several other areas that I think are very important in terms of the in inclusiveness of anybody that's involved in, 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 in setting the priorities uh, on clinical research, the uh, reviewability of any decisions that happen to get happen to get made, the broad-based nature of, of the inquiry that it's not just about drugs. It sounds sexy to talk about the drugs, but frankly, that's happening a lot already. Um, it's a lot about the whole system uh, that, as I mentioned before, um, and, and then some of the risks that we have in terms of preventing this from becoming a tool for rationing and cost control, as it has in every other country on earth where the government has gotten involved in comparative effectiveness research. Thank you, Alex. Bob? Does uh, CER extend beyond drugs to areas such as medical devices and diagnostics, and should it be because of their unique aspects? The answer is yes, it does extend beyond, and, it, and potentially it's more important. Uh, first, a, a quick disclaimer. I am uh, no longer with GE Healthcare. I, I was with them for over three years, but I'm currently independent. So I have been in the pharmaceutical industry as an executive, the medical device and the diagnostic, and, and currently independent. Also, another dis disclaimer, I'm going to speak broadly to, to industry trends and not to any specific practices. So why is CER potentially more important for medical devices and diagnostics? Number one is that they don't require, for the most part, clinical data to get regulatory approval, which means no clinical data is available at the time of launch to guide procedure, patient selection, clinical application. Also, as a result, there's very little infrastructure and internal expertise within the industry related to clinical outcomes research. Now, there are exceptions, companies that are developing implantable class three devices and also diagnostic companies that are, that are going for screening indications. Why is it more important? Uh, medical device and diagnostics involve procedures, techniques, usage that leads to a wide variation in accuracy and in interpretation and in effectiveness in outcomes. So unlike pharma, there is a learning curve. The more you do, the better you get. Uh, outcome studies are necessary to document and mitigate this kind of variation. Now, randomized controlled trials can be lim limiting in this area in their generalizability. And I say this because there's, there's the use of expert sites, and those sites are trained to a very high level. So you're, you're using the experts, and it's very difficult for the community to duplicate their results. I believe there's a case for innovative, prospective cohort studies and registries to capture real-world usage and also patient selection. Uh, lastly, in the industry, resources internally are prioritized to generating a continual stream of next-generation products. Most incorporate new features that drive up price, but the medical and clinical benefits are not known of these next-generation uh, devices. What, is, what happens is that they are launched into the clinic and then they are explored if there is time for that research to take place before the next generation of medical device comes out. Uh, many next generation products focus on ease of use and throughput, and this can fuel the perverse financial incentives to use the product. Uh, also, many executives in the industry fear that if you invest in outcome studies, you'll, you'll rise all boats and you'll actually uh, provide benefit to, to your competitor. Now, specific procedures in diagnostics have been prioritized by the Institute of Medicine based on high cost, potential redundancy, uh, important clinical questions, procedures such as implantable cardiac defibrillators, where this $30,000 device only fires and helps less than 20% of patients that are implanted, uh, the indications for coronary stents, where we know a single patient can receive so many coronary stents in their vasculature that the medical term full metal jacket is now applied. 
Uh, diseases such as prostate can cancer, uh, where it's been documented there is overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Uh, a great example I'll give is in the field of cardiac diagnostic imaging. It's a great example of redundancy for the evaluation of chronic chest pain. There are multiple modalities looking at anatomy, CT, magnetic resonance, or in the cath lab you can use fluoroscopy in, a, in an invasive procedure. For function of the heart, looking at ischemia, there are EKG stress tests, there are echocardiography stress tests, there are nuclear stress tests. So many of these tests are overused and uh, many provide financial incentive, uh, uh, in particular nuclear stress testing in the outpatient setting. Uh, I, I want to quickly reference Dennis Freibeck and John Thornberry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They published on the hierarchy of evidence required for diagnostics. It's an excellent model. Levels one and two focus on technical quality uh, or, or resolution of the image. Uh, level two is on diagnostic accuracy. Those levels of evidence have been the focus for the last several decades. I believe the higher levels of evidence are going to be required as we move in to this new healthcare environment for change. Level three focuses on the effect and fit into the overall diagnostic plan. So if there are multiple choices of diagnostics, which is first line? What second line? What patient population to use it in? Level four focuses on the effect on the patient management plan. Will the information yield a change in the clinical decision making? Very important. And level five is what is the effect on patient outcomes? So in summary, I believe that the industry needs to change their model, invest more in outcome studies, and staff up internally. Uh, there's a case for CER being more important because of relative ease of regulatory approval, uh, variation in usage and outcomes, and also the focus on incremental innovation. There's also a case for innovative prospective trial design and health economic decision modeling, given the number of redundant technologies that exist. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And Daryl, how does CER relate to our ongoing health care reform discussion? It, it's quite a discussion. I, I came to my position after being a medical school dean, health system CEO, three years ago. And I had no idea I was getting a ticket to the political debate of our decade. It's, it's been fascinating to watch it. And uh, I think, although it isn't talked about every day, I think the issue of comparative effectiveness research is actually deeply embedded in this in, in two important ways. The, the first way is the phrase you start to hear more and more of now, which is how do we bend the curve uh, and this really reflects our notion that it isn't necessarily that we believe we will spend at an absolutely less amount on health care in the U.S., but can we keep that rise from the steep slope it's been on, bend the curve of spending downward? And there's great hope that if we do what was described around drugs and devices, uh, we can bend that curve. Uh, as a physician, I think this is, is fascinating because I think it's an area that has enormous promise but also tremendous pitfalls. And so I'll give you a very short story that, that illustrates this. Uh, I trained in psychiatry and uh, did NIH research for over a decade. My area of focus was schizophrenia, which you don't hear talked about much, unfortunately, but a devastating illness affecting 1% of the population easily, perhaps more. Uh, 50 years ago in this country, at places like St. Elizabeth's in Washington or Creedmoor in New York, you had thousands of people with this illness warehoused with nothing to do for them. And then through pharmaceutical research, drugs were discovered. The first two under their brand names were Thorazine, Haldol, and suddenly, people could respond, leave the hospitals. Now, 30 years ago, I was a fresh-faced young resident uh, assigned to one of these state hospitals. I, had, I, I was the only physician on a unit of 50 chronic schizophrenic patients. Uh, and patients would come, stay, sometimes much too long and go. And by this time, we had approaching 12 different drugs, and more were in the pipeline and coming out. But we had no real framework 
for saying which drug in which case do we choose. It was only in the last few years that the NIH <coughs> extramural program invested in a study that was called CATI was the acronym, but it, it was lining up in a, in a complex design about five or six of the older drugs and the newer drugs and comparing them and it yielded, this was in 1,500 patients roughly, it yielded great information and if you read the information superficially, it said the old drugs, which were now available generically, were as good as the new drugs. Here's where the pitfall came in. Immediately, some funding bodies, state Medicaid entities and others said, we have our answer, right? We'll only pay for the old drugs. The problem was, if you really read the study, what you saw was it depended on the patient. It depended on their situation, their tolerance for side effects, what their prior response had been. So you had a policy overreaction, but from the pragmatic point of view, psychiatrists today are better informed, making better decisions, and in many cases are able to use lower cost treatments for patients, and in other cases are able to justify higher cost treatments. That's how it should work. But the overreaction, I think, is what concerns a lot of people in the health care reform debate. Carolyn Clancy, who heads uh, the Agency for Health Research Quality, has a great phase. She said, we have to give doctors tools, not rules. And so this phase one of the health care reform debate is how much do we let blind, reflexive uh, responses to comparative effectiveness data create rules that may not serve patients well. The second phase fascinates me even more because it's almost never talked about, and that is how little we know about what, which delivery systems work better than others. You know, most of you have heard this phrase about we all need medical homes, but we really know precious little about for different diseases and different populations how to design those, what the outcomes would be for the patients, how much they would cost. And so my great hope is that comparative effectiveness, is, as has been recommended by the ILM and others, actually gets extended not just to drugs, devices, but we actually start saying, what kind of care system works best for the urban poor, uh, for the rural population, for different parts of America? How do we design delivery and compare the way it really accomplishes the job? Thank you. Thank you all. They're very good. They followed the five-minute rule. That's why they make us do these pre-calls, you see, I see. All right, who's ready? Yes, sir. I think I appreciate that. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist, but I would like to ask either uh, Alex or Dr. Porter or Daryl. I, I spent my time as a senior advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And my comment is that the methodologies of either the CERs or the randomized control trials, in the face of what might be a public epi epidemic, the kinds of problems in the psychological health or black concussion, really are so constricted that we are not able to uh, effectively identify treatments and evaluate them and field them in an expeditious way. Uh, there have been some conversations about different statistical tools and methodologies to accomplish sort of real-world visibility of it. But it appears that whatever the, the lobbying or influences are, that, that they're not being supported. And then I'd like to hear maybe your ideas of what we could do to uh, use and, and implement some of these different tools. Because we've got <coughs> problems that are going to come face us much more dramatically in a much quicker fashion than currently the way we conduct science and technology is going to enable us to do these things. Hmm. Let's take a stab at that. Uh, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a complete answer, but I think the, the, the point that you raised about the nature of the evidence that we, that we need to use is something that I hope FDA and Congress will start studying in greater depth because right now to get – for us, as a, uh, for us as an innovator to be able to talk about our own products really requires phase three clinical trials, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in order to say anything positive about the product. Um, 
the, the challenge, though, is, is that the right evidence standard for every aspect of the utilization of a drug? I'm, I'm not a scientist. I, I don't know, but I think we need to have that discussion because we certainly, on, uh, in terms of the, uh, there's a one-way ratchet, we, we need that type of information for talking proactively, positively about, about a medicine, but epidemiological meta-analysis, statistical analysis, claims reviews, that all is a one-way ratchet on the negative side. And so as we move towards the kind of personalized medicine that you're talking about as a vision for treating our soldiers, we, we really have got to figure out better ways of titrating evidence and being able to communicate about the nature of that evidence so that the decision makers, the doctors involved, and population-based decision makers have an adequate evidence base to do it. But right now, the rules are the rules. We're, you know, we're going to comply with them. But, but, the, but I think it is a worthy question of debate about are we looking at the evidence standards um, as, we, as we talked. We had a presentation yesterday from Sigma Tau talking about very rare disorders and developing medicines for them and applying one-size-fits-all um, evidence standards to get a drug to, to market, and then we and then we ask ourselves, well, why are these medicines so expensive when they finally you know when they finally get to market when it when it's going to cost 1.4 billion or more per product to go through all of that and build the same evidence base? And I just, as a non-scientist, I, I just think there are probably other pools of evidence and other techniques we could have at looking at the data that would give us the ability to titrate medical solutions better than we currently do. I'd like to take a stab at this because I think you asked specifically about blast concussion. Correct? And, you know, within the Department of Defense, you're obviously looking at a way to diagnose it and then come to uh, develop some kind of algorithm, clinical decision uh, type of, of algor algorithm, really. So when you think about it, you, you don't have to deal with some of the regulatory obstacles that industry would have to deal with. And what I would suggest uh, is looking at surrogate markers. That's something that, that can be a difficult negotiation with the FDA, but if you're talking about injury to the brain, there are markers that you can, uh, through molecular imaging and other imaging, you can, you, you can quantify uh, the disorder and, and certainly identify it, localize it. Um, you may, you know, we're not looking at a development here. Uh, a regulatory approval. You're just looking for a clinical decision type of model within the Department of Defense. So I, I would recommend some kind of imaging approach and standardization. Do you have a comment there? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I, I can speak to that because that, that has to do with surgical and procedural development and introduction of new technologies. Right now, as part of the regulatory path, there is not a requirement to look at the comparative effectiveness of, for example, radical prostatectomy versus brachytherapy. It's not a requirement. And in fact, you look at radical prostatectomy, there are many different approaches that might vary in their outcomes, and in particular having to do with uh, the adverse events that, that could occur post-surgery. So, um, you know, this I think prostate cancer is one of our, a, an incredible dilemma we have from a society standpoint in that there just was data, finally, on PSA testing that has shown that it does not change outcome. It's an overly sensitive test 
So it is over-diagnosing individuals. Uh, men are undergoing uh, millions of biopsies, invasive biopsies. I think it's quantified at 2 million a year. That's twice as many uh, than breast bi biopsies that are performed. And uh, getting over-treated with, with brachytherapy and, and, and a number, there are at least five or six different therapy areas that probably need to be tested side by side. If I could, yeah, please. could just add to this, though. T taking us back to the, the potential of health care reform, uh, a lot of the discussion you hear talks about uh, better use of information systems. And I think when we, when we think of this as patients, we just wish we could go to the doctor and have our record somehow be there instead of reinventing it mm -hmm. uh, at each visit. And so we think about the electronic personalized record. But if we really invest properly in IT and gather information the way we should, a lot of these questions can be answered naturally out of the clinical database that's generated within a population. And you can compare treatments or multiple treatments side by side and then look at longer term outcomes. It is, uh, you know, in one of the earlier panels there was a discussion about uh, people's fears around health care reform and what we'll have to give up. Uh, there's so much to gain by actually having our information used well instead of having it fragmented and inaccessible <coughs> and uninterpretable the way it is now. We often don't, um, we don't see the examples under our own nose. When I was a medical student, I'm sure you had this experience, many of us trained in VA hospitals, but VA hospitals were not necessarily viewed uh, as the place you'd want to be a patient. They were viewed as, as impersonal and not state-of-the-art. Uh, I would love to be a patient in most VA hospitals now. And it's their use of information technology, their training of interprofessional teams, their patient-centeredness, focus on patient satisfaction, and it's their ability to use their data to answer questions about the population they're serving. So if we can transform that small portion of America's health care, it gives me hope that we could innovate in other areas. Yes, sir. Great. Uh, so, Dr. Kirsch, you were talking about um, watching out for this imperative of effectiveness to um, create rules versus tools and, and also look at special populations or different populations um, and to everybody. Is there a place for simulation of the drugs and medical devices to um, take a look at I'm speaking as a medical educator. Uh, the, the new simulation technology is really transformative, but it's mainly around training. Uh, especially, you know, a good example would be if you go to Southern Illinois University. They have an incredible facility right across from the operating rooms where a surgeon can go in and using simulation technology practice a difficult procedure uh, before they go in the OR. I want to be that patient. You know, yeah. I would rather not be the one who was practiced on. Uh, so I see it more as being a training tool as opposed to necessarily being a comparative effectiveness tool. But, but I would defer to my colleagues. First of all, I second what you say on that. I mean, the, the movement toward uh, approaching surgical procedures as a pilot would be um, approaching a flight is, is, is really quite, quite effective. Uh, I think there is, actually, and it's, it's in the field of uh, decision modeling and health economic modeling, which really brings us into the, the realm of cost effectiveness. And I might be in the minority here, but I do believe there is a role for cost effectiveness in comparative effectiveness research. I, I think it's inevitable. And decision modeling is kind of a benign way to use the medical literature to come up with all of your assumptions, put together your decision tree, all of your branches, uh, put in your various assumptions, and, and then run scenario analyses. It, it actually can come up with some important uh, uh, output on what price or cost the where the procedure uh, or the technology might be more cost effective. 
there is quite a bit of pricing in the industry, and I'll just speak to medical device and diagnostics, which is not done uh, using, you know, very rigorous models. So I, I think the, it, it is a real up-and-coming and burgeoning field. The U.S. Prevention Services Task Force uses it for all their screening decisions. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's important. Could I, could I, I uh, ask Alex or, or Bob, since you use the C word, cost, <laughs> which is closely related in America to the R word, rationing, <laughs> uh, and since this was such a centerpiece in the, uh, the debate, and I think um, in much of the press, industry was, was painted as being just diametrically opposed to cost analysis. I mean, what, since you've had strong industry ties, what are your perspectives on that? I think, again, the, quest, the key question becomes the structure around how you're doing this research and who's using the research and for what purpose. And so when, when one of the big payers is looking at the data that we provide, uh, about comparative effectiveness or even cost effectiveness, obviously they're making a formulary decision based on cost effectiveness. Um, and that's a perfectly rational thing for a private sector payer to do in a competitive marketplace. They're deciding what kind of benefit package they're going to stack up to compete against a, a, another private sector health plan because they know that if they don't strike that balance correctly, the employers and the beneficiaries are going to go to the other plan. So if I decide, if, if, if I'm an employer or, or an individual and I decide that I really want to be able to insure against the particular risk through a kind of drug and the insurance plan that I have does not offer the opportunity for me to pay a little extra to insure against that risk, I'm going to switch to another. So in, in a competitive marketplace, and there's a lot we can do to improve the competition among our insurance plans, but in a truly competitive marketplace, the private plans are internalizing the aggregation of individual consumer preferences and ought to be coming up with the right answer. The challenge you have when you deal with single-payer systems in Europe, which I have dealt with now for a very long time, or if you deal with a government-controlled system here in America like a, fee, like a Medicare fee-for-service is you don't, as a patient, have an option. There's no check on that discretion, on that cost-effectiveness determination. It's an aggregate population-based decision that doesn't factor in an individual's, an individual's need. The individual doesn't have the choice to switch to another system to get that access. And so that's the challenge. That's, the, that's why there's so much concern and why the discussion around cost effectiveness and comparative effectiveness is intimately bound up with the questions around the structure of our health insurance system post-health reform here in America. Kristen? I, I, can I answer that too? So, look, can, we, can we come back to that? Because I want to make sure. sure we have a lot of hands up, and I want to sure everybody gets a chance um, there. So I just wanted to ask, in an ideal world, like let's say I make money, you guys run the world, how would, <laughs> how would CER be implemented? Like I'm hearing Alex worrying that his company is going to be rationed. Daryl is worried that this will be applied too, ri too rigidly. Like how should it work? If you could, if you could have whatever you wanted, how, how would this work in the real world? Let me, let me take a stab at just in top line. Um, I would certainly start with making sure that all the data that's being collected on all of us every time we access the health system is being shared in a de-aggregated, you know, so we retain privacy, um, being shared with uh, researchers who are looking at so many different aspects of how do we get to the next stage, how do we make things better? How can we be more personalized and targeted, get the right treatment to the right person at the right time? Um, that simple, just that sharing, collecting, keeping, and sharing information about everybody um, will drive, uh, I think more than anything else, drive toward a healthier population at lower cost. So we have, uh, I mean, in the ideal world, we would all commit more of our national treasure to fund the research in this area because in many cases we're suffering from a real knowledge gap. You know, there, there's been great basic science discoveries, some of it done at universities and NIH. There's been wonderful industry development, taking those discoveries forward. Things come to market, but we haven't invested in the kinds of research like that study I mentioned that then circles back and rolls it together. And we haven't invested in the IT to do what Mary just described, to, to pull the information together. So we'd say, we want to be a great nation, we're going to invest in these things. I, I, I would just say more information, more information, more information. Um, 
uh, information just is not a bad thing. And then the question then becomes, how do you use the information? Right. What's well, the structure in which you use it? And how do we keep the patient at the center? Who should be paying for it, and who should be doing it? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a balance. Who, obviously, if you're talking about drug um, uh, or device, we as the innovators and as the owner of the intellectual property have a real incentive to demonstrate the value proposition around our, around our product. Um, and so when we think about how information flows, we need to recognize that we don't disempower these same organizations who have the most incentive to generate the information uh, from, from, from doing so. When we talk about some of the very important things that Daryl talked about, about healthcare delivery systems, how, how we make those more efficient, I'm not sure any individual hospital generally has enough incentive to do the large-scale studies that you need to really decide um, what's the best way to deliver ER care? What, what will lead to the most efficient, highest quality outcomes? I'm sure that can happen, but does everybody have the same incentive and then are they going to share that type of information? I, I, I'm not sure, but the bottom line is we, we always have got to keep, as we think about the information and how it's used around comparative effectiveness, is think about the patient and not the aggregate, the average patient, the individual patient. If that individual patient is at the center of the structure and how that information is getting used, we're going to get to the right answer. Because I don't know about you, but I don't view myself as average. I don't want just because the average or the aggregate works out to have my health care determinations made by that. I want to be able to get health care that is tailored to me as an individual, my genetic profile, my health risks, everything else. Um, and that's, that is the... That is the gem of the American system that no matter what we change, I hope we will retain that individual patient centricity that I think is the high point of what we do in America, even with any failings we have in our system. One more, I, I think, One more for Bob and then we'll go back to you. Great. I, I think the question who pays and who conducts the studies, is a, those are critical questions. And some of these trials that we're talking about here are quite large. We're talking about some enormous trials. So. I don't see government, I don't see industry pulling this off alone. I mean, it really is going to require public-private partnerships and collaborations. And I think there's going to be a trend for more government, society-endorsed trials rather than coming right from industry. So, you know, the, the network already exists in the oncology field with the clinical cooperative groups, you know. Uh, and uh, I think societies are starting to take ownership of many more clinical trials. Okay, we're going to go one, two, three, four, and then we'll get to five after that. Yes. <laughs> You know, I, uh, there are problems, frankly, with, with, with each of the systems. I mean, NICE, NICE is certainly the godfather of the organizations, uh, along with Australia in, and Canada, in, in doing this type of comparative effectiveness or health technology assessment uh, uh, work. And, but even, even NICE right now, uh, the government itself has had to initiate a government-sponsored self-evaluation of NICE because of a lot of the criticism about patient access to medicine and whether whether – um, whether UK citizens are getting access to cancer treatments. There was a Karolinska Institute study in uh, 2007 that demonstrated that in, 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 in certain countries in Europe, access to the latest cancer therapies was dramatically reduced compared or delayed compared to others and ascribed as a potential cause of that the health technology assessment processes. Um, I think that I haven't yet seen a system that I believe has the kind of full adequate transparency that you would want to have the um, the, the, the patient genuinely being at the table, the innovator being at the table. Um, you sometimes will get consumer at, at the table, but it's a patient. It's, it's the patient needs to be there, and there needs to be reviewability. The, these these determines, determinations need to, you've got to have the ability for an outside third party, whether it's a court or some other governmental body, to genuinely review these, these types of decisions. So I think there, I think, they're all well-meaning. They're trying to get there, but I, don't, I haven't seen anyone yet that I would say is perfect or ought to be a model for us. They're, they've been building this over the last decade, basically. Yes, sir. So a lot of concern about the way CEO is set out in other countries and that it's limiting access and um, real desire to improve as many as we can. How do our lifespan stack up to those countries where they have 
it would it would be a false comparison right now because CER really is, has taken place. Nice was created only in the late '90s, and originally, actually, Nice was created as a body to increase access to medicines to get rid of postcode prescribing, where individual primary care trusts were denying denying access to treatment, and the idea was to force out so you didn't just depending on where your postcode was, you didn't get access or not access to the best treatments. And of course, then it became a tool for actually reducing access and controlling cost in the system. So any of the disparities that we have in terms of life expectancy in the U.S. to other countries, um, it, it, it would be, it, it, you, there's no way you could draw any kind of linkage to cost effectiveness or comparative effectiveness in, in that. I mean, even if you take some of that data as valid and if you remove out some of the other very important um, factors that would go into those comparisons that get bandied about by WHO and Commonwealth Fund that I'm, I'm just not sure, frankly, are adequate comparisons about the quality of the American health care system. Bob? Bob and then Great. I would say that comparative effectiveness research and government decisions are already being made, and primarily through CMS as well as the Agency for Health Research and Quality. And when they open up a national coverage analysis, within a year they're going to come up with whether Medicare will cover it nationally or whether it will be a non-coverage. And then there is usually following of private and private payers. So that has happened in a number of technologies and fields. It's already happening. And, and, and one of the major reasons for non-coverage decisions is that there is a lack of good effectiveness data. The, the literature is, 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 is very scant. You know, I, I, I want to inject a, a note of caution. In an ideal world, you'd compare, take thousands of patients, compare the treatments, look at the outcomes, make your decision. But we live in a very complex world, and we, we are in danger of making a mistake of saying that the U.S. Um, spend so much more than other countries do to attain the great health results that they do. One of the things, if you look at some of the lower spending developed countries, they do a much, much better job than we do in investing in social programs and they have a lower rate of poverty. And uh, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is that outcomes in the U.S. aren't just dependent on the drug or the device. Uh, or even the delivery system somebody's in. When I've been looking at readmission rates in hospitals. Often people in the U.S. are precipitously readmitted to the hospital, not because of a failure in the treatment or the medical care, but because of their total lack of a social support system mm -hmm. outside. So I, I think one of our biggest challenges in this country is going to be how do we ever factor those social determinants of health into these analyses. Judy? Um, as we get more into personalized medicine, um, that sort of undermines the whole idea of what concept of a, an average patient. So do you see then as we're evolving with our, our understanding of what puts people at risk or what makes people get cancer or whatever, um, the, would then I think, I think you hit exactly on it that um, I have a real concern we're just at the beginning of personalized medicine and I mean even in the next decade we're not going to be there yet we've, 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 we've unlocked just so little of our understanding at this point of human physiology that um, this kind of a system that is based on aggregates and averages really can deprive that, that personalized medicine approach especially if you don't build the data standards around smaller pools of patients and the type of data that's available for smaller pools of patients. Um, I don't know if Mary's got thoughts on this, but it's, it, that's, that's one of my biggest concerns for the future is that we don't set up a system now that's going to be an impediment to where, to the great hope of scientific progress that we're just standing on the verge of. Yeah, I would say that we're, um, where we are now in um, trial and error medicine, if you will, uh, and, and healthcare is always going to be an art and a science. But we don't have all the benefit of even what we already know um, in a way that um, is, is a tool 
for the practicing physician or for the patient. You know, we don't we don't have it put together properly, and that's where all the um, health IT comes in, and we're really committing as a nation to a learning healthcare system, so that we're learning all the time. Uh, that in I believe that in combination with the kind of biomedical science that's driving personalized medicine through the genome and um, everything that's going along with it, uh, we will, I think, get to a place that personalized medicine isn't something to be afraid of or more costly. It's actually going to be very realistic and an answer. But we need both. It isn't all driven by biomedical research by any means. I do think that uh, personalized medicine and pharmacogenomics in particular, it, that's the big idea. I mean, if you can identify the drugs or the procedure that is always going to be effective um, for an individual or, or a high-risk population, then that might even supplant cost uh, comparative effectiveness research. So, um, you know, right now everything is obviously population-based. I'd, I'd very much like to see pharmaceutical companies uh, be more aggressive in the area of pharmacogenomics. You, sir, you, sir, you, sir, you, sir. <laughs> and maybe you, ma'am. If, if, if we can do good Q&As, we can get this all in. So uh, you be first, sir. I find it fascinating that the sacred cow in this debate continues to be the physician when I, I believe and I think um, there's plenty of data to suggest that um, the cost overruns are oftentimes tied to variability <laughs> in uh, physicians adherence to algorithms. Evidence-based medicine already demonstrates mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. were they to adhere to those algorithms, we'd be not only seeing better um, outcomes but also saving money. So, from a political standpoint, why is it? I was really unclear as to why the physicians themselves are escaping all of this um, critical review and debate and what may be regulation. I, I don't think the physicians are escaping it at all. In fact, I think it's prompting one of the most long overdue discussions about physicians and their education uh, that we've needed in this country, and that is the notion of continuing medical education. You know, continuing professional education should be the place in which emerging new treatments and the evidence that supports or doesn't support them, uh, the development of clinical guidelines, treatment algorithms is processed by the physician, but instead, through you know nobody's uh, malicious intentions, we just happened to design a continuing medical education system that was much different and didn't accomplish those goals. And right now, the, the, the debate that rages among the professional societies, the specialty societies that I speak with, is they know we have to get there to continuing education that's focused on closing the gap between what we know and how we practice but we're a long way away from it, and that's, uh, that's pretty wrenching. It's wrenching economically. I'd like to think it's tied primarily to education, but I believe it's more likely linked to perverse economic incentives. Well, that's, that's the other thing. Folly is hoping for A while rewarding B. You know, if we hope for wise choices in drugs and ordering tests, <coughs> but if the reimbursement systems are designed the opposite direction, what, why should we be surprised as a nation? Physicians are human beings. They are susceptible to incentives. I, I, I agree with you that I, the sacred cow is the perverse financial incentives, and we don't like to discuss that. But, but I would agree that um, there has been increased oversight around adherence to guidelines. I, I think particularly after the publication of the, the Institute of Medicine's uh, quality chasm reports, so focusing on medical errors, preventable medical errors. I, I think they have, uh, you know, it depends by the hospital, the institution, uh, the, the integrated deliver, delivery network. Uh, I think we're going to see a whole new generation of decision support software that is going to allow physicians to be more compliant by giving them the information at the point of care when they make a decision and synthesize all of the literature. As Maybe I'm sensitive to this coming from a group that represents 100,000 or so faculty physicians. 
There's a fellow named Tom Gorey who worked with J and J for a long time, and he said something once that that really explained to me the bind a lot of physicians feel in that even the physician who wants to practice in line with the best evidence and who is least susceptible to perverse incentives often faces the prototypic American patient. In the way Tom describes the patient, they want the best treatment, they want it immediately, they want uh, the latest drug, especially if they saw it on television last night, they want somebody else to pay for it, and if anything goes wrong, they want to sue somebody. <laughs> and often it's difficult on the front lines of care delivery to be a doctor in the face of patients with those kinds of expectations. So. Uh, I'm not trying to get the doctors off the hook, but we need to put ourselves on the hook as patients. Too. Yes, sir. I took a tour through Washington in the spring and I met with 14 different uh, the leadership on both sides of the aisle and the health committees. Um, I was really curious to learn what, what was the objection primarily on the Republican side to comparative assessment. Right? And what I learned was the real fear is that you're gathering data that exists today, which is incomplete, to support some bureaucratic regulatory infrastructure to make sort of population. Your, your question, it presumes two things. One is that there's a discernible single right answer on some of these issues with regard to drugs. And the second is that there would be a decision maker that would be the government that would make a decision that would then bind the entire health care system. And as to both of those issues, I think there'd have to be some fundamental disagreement um, that, you, that more information is a good thing. We're in favor of generating more information. We do generate it. We're in the information business. We, you know, we, do, we, do, we deliver two things. We deliver a molecule and we deliver information about how that molecule is best used. The, if you're going to get to the point, you, know, you said, if you, you got to the point of having a decision about what, uh, what drug or whatever else ought to be used, then it would, a reimbursement decision would get made. That presumes a single-payer system. That presumes a government body making that decision, which is, which is an, anath an anathema to having a patient-centric competitive insurance market in the United States where individual insurance companies are making different decisions. There may be a lot of common data out there that's in the public domain. There may be private, informa private information that, that, com that insurance companies are using, but that still is a diversity of decisions about reimbursement, not a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. reimbursement decision made at the center. What if it weren't? All right, let's, let's, let me go to somebody else so we can get our quota in here. Yes, sir. structure, architecture, and data models to collect the information in the context of the software that we're going to get these doctors adopting to actually support CER, where all they're just going to go out and give them a bunch of tools that are going to have no impact on CER because we're not going to have the data models in place and the architecture to easily capture that data and make something useful out of it. Okay, 
take one response from the panel. Who wants it? I'll go for it. You know, <laughs> is it in place today? I, I think there are many independent type of systems, databases, registries, many quite sophisticated. Uh, some, uh, you know, the 10% that use electronic medical records, uh, th there's some interesting consortium of, of electronic medical record data. It's only outpatient data. It doesn't include in-hospital submission. So a lot of the da databases are incomplete. So as IT gets rolled out and adopted and standardized, the question is, how does it fit into the existing architecture? And uh, I think that's going to be difficult. I don't think there's any magic bridging program. And I think there are probably better experts in the audience. Yes, sir. Answer that. I haven't heard anyone say that CER is not a good thing. I mean, the, the, I, mean I think everyone here views the creation of additional information as a, as a positive social good and good for the system. My only point would be I, I don't, don't think that you're going to use CER just on pharmaceuticals, which are 10 percent of the budget, and also probably one of the more value-based part of our health care system already, given that you've essentially got three or four large PBMs negotiating against insurance companies on behalf of a couple hundred million Americans. Um, compared to, say, the hospital space, the long-term care space, the physician space. We have so much we can learn there. As the gentleman said before, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. Um, we, we have so little we know about how to improve that care delivery system there and so much efficiency that we can get out of that. Um, just if you look at the Dartmouth Atlas studies on care delivery, um, if, you, if you took the, the – the highest quality, lowest cost performers and simply took the methodology of care delivery there and exported it throughout the country in the Medicare program, and the savings are shocking that you would achieve just by, by that. And that has nothing to do with the pharmaceutical space. I, I would support that, but this is the challenge for America. If you look at these low cost areas, many of them, I mean, the, the litany always focuses on places like Geisinger, uh, Inner Mountain in Salt Lake, uh, Mayo in Rochester. Even Mayo had a very different experience when they went to Florida and Arizona and, and tried to transpose themselves to a different geography. The, the challenge for us, the, the inefficiencies in the cost aren't in the drugs and technology as much as they are in a very, very dysfunctional delivery system. And that system has to be redesigned. It's my personal belief that we're not going to go from Mayo to the entire nation in one fell swoop. And I'm, I'm very supportive of Allison Schwartz has a bill in the House to create health care innovation zones that would essentially take willing regions with partners within the region who would scale up the things we know about better delivery systems. One you know, last question. You know, I think just on that question, I, what I heard was, is it a good investment, comparative effectiveness, compared to roads or, or other issues? And I would say the answer is yes, because – Ultimately, you're going to increase quality and efficiency. That's your return on investment. So it is a good investment. Would you like the last question? <laughs> well, then I will then take this opportunity. Unless anybody's got like a pick me comment they want me to, you know, they want to say before we uh, wrap it up. Pick me, pick me. You know, remember that whole thing. <laughs> um, I want to thank this panel and I want to thank this audience. Um, you know, we all live in fear in this panel business of, are there going to be questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? You took care of that very well. So thank everybody very much for being here and enjoy the rest of the conference.